Well, since this situation occurred in uh, July, um, as you can imagine, there was great shock in the country because just four and a half months earlier, there was the MH370 disaster. So for the country to go through such unprecedented air aircraft disasters in such a short span of time, uh, you know, really shocked a lot of people. And uh, people are looking for answers. Now, because the Malaysian media being so far from the situation in Ukraine, local media didn't cover what was going on there uh, up until the crash happened. So I think here there was really a rush um, for local journalists to understand what was going on. And I think in such a, a short span of time, uh, Malaysian journalists and the media here were not really able to get a clear picture of the political situation and uh, exactly what, what the basis for the fighting in Ukraine was. So if we remember the first, uh, the first few days of the situation, uh, the media was primarily uh, focusing on the, the possibility that the separatists in eastern Ukraine uh, shot down the aircraft. There were certain things that were presented at first, such as uh, audio tapes, uh, audio recordings that were later proven to be, you know, uh, uh, doctored. And other information like this that the, the media um, picked up in the country uh, because there was, there was not um, uh, counter evidence at the time. Uh, so the media in the country was at the time in, in the beginning at least echoing some of the claims that uh, we were seeing in the Western media. Uh, primarily the Russia was culpable. But after the Russian Defense Ministry presented uh, you know their their findings which were the fact that they found radiation coming from several uh, surface-to-air missile batteries what we call BUK, you know surface-to-air missiles uh, you know, in a part of Ukraine uh, that was controlled by the government, that the Ukrainian government said that there were no such, you know, uh, uh, defenses in there before. And also we have this information about uh, the Sukhoi jet, which would obviously belong to Ukrainian air forces. The rebels don't possess uh, that equipment. So this changes the, uh, the situation completely. And uh, we saw in the beginning, we saw what was really a political verdict um, being meted out by the media and by Western governments who, uh, without presenting anything to substantiate their allegations, they presented uh, Russia as being responsible for this and the uh, rebels in eastern Ukraine who, uh, from what we can tell, they don't possess the capacity to bring down a commercial airliner flying at 33,000 feet. So uh, after we saw that the Western governments, you know, they, they were not able to present any adequate, um, a adequate uh, you know, evidence to substantiate their claims. Uh, the Malaysian media sort of took notice of, of this and, and I believe that here in the country, people in the foreign ministry and, and, and in the media and elsewhere, they, te they started to perhaps question if there were political motives behind this. I think early on right away uh, because we saw you know certain uh, countries using this for political gain, using the situation for political gain. Primarily the um, United States enforcing sanctions uh, on the sectors, various sectors of Russia's economy after this, which previously European countries were reluctant to do. We see uh, Ukraine as well um, attempting to forge a closer military relationship uh, with the United States and NATO. Um, we heard recently there was Ukrainian uh, Independence Day recently and at the parade Poroshenko um, discussed his plans to increase uh, military spending uh, in Ukraine by over 50 percent. Uh, so this is certainly, um, uh, he's using the situation uh, you know, with the conflict in eastern Ukraine and certainly the psychological impact that the downing of a civilian aircraft had to justify this huge, I mean, unprecedented increase in defense spending. And also recently, um, over the weekend, uh, NATO Secretary General Rasmussen gave an interview to several European newspapers where he discussed that uh, to combat the Russian aggression, which is, uh, I mean, in the minds of a European public and, uh, you know, U.S. public and elsewhere, uh, they're associating this with MH17 and, and that Russia's fingerprints are on this somehow. Uh, and, uh, you know, NATO is discussing having 
permanent military bases in Eastern Europe. I would imagine in uh, Poland and in the Baltic states as well. But this really represents a huge escalation. And I think throughout the situation in Ukraine, we've seen so many situations where um, you know, certain things are, are, uh, are not reported you know, in a balanced way. And uh, I believe that uh, there are, uh, there's, a, there's a strategy here to get uh, Malaysians are by and large judging from the reports coming out of the media they feel very frustrated with the slow pace of the investigation in mid-July there was a UN Security Council resolution 2166 which passed unanimously which called for uh, a ceasefire in eastern Ukraine in the area where the plane was uh, shot down and uh, it called for an impartial thorough investigation into the events of the crash and uh, in early August I believe uh, you know the Ukrainian government uh, backtracked on this commitment and unilaterally abandoned the ceasefire and and in early August as well the rebels in eastern Ukraine they also called for a ceasefire and the Ukrainian government is uh, is not been open to uh, you know uh, it's not been uh, open to their suggestions um, and they've pushed push forward with the military operation. That's the reason there's no information coming out of, uh, of Ukraine right now. So this has created a great deal of frustration in, um, in Malaysia. And as one month has passed, I think some of the reporters and columnists in the country, um, they've had an adequate amount of time to read up on the situation in Ukraine and familiarize themselves with the, the happenings uh, that's been, that, that have you know, taken place in Ukraine over the past year, since February when there was a you know, change of power in Kiev and the uh, country's geopolitical situation was completely realigned you know, since that time. Uh, so since then, we've seen Malaysian media reports come out with several uh, articles that were very, very critical of the Western narrative, that were very, very critical of the Ukrainian uh, narrative. And we've also seen newspapers like the New Straits Times interview the Ukrainian ambassador to Malaysia and even throughout the interview casting doubt on some of the claims that he was saying, pointing out that even his own claims contradicted the line coming out of Kiev. So uh, I believe more than ever, because there's been a failure on the Western side and a failure from Kiev to substantiate their claims with any hard evidence, meanwhile Russia has presented some something to be scrutinized, you know, um, some uh, tangible forensic evidence, satellite images, military data, and what have you. I think the Malaysians have picked up on this and they realize that um, there's a, a political equation to this situation. And uh, as such, the local journalists have, have asked difficult questions. They've pointed out that there are um, many uh, inconvenient uh, facts coming out and perhaps they're asking questions that, you know, these facts are, are um, being concealed in the Western media, primarily because they reveal and they shine light on a, a very uncomfortable truth. And that truth may be that, uh, you know, Ukrainian military had an involvement in this situation. As I understand, the, uh, the, the convoys were in, in the waiting on the Russian border, Russian Ukrainian border, for it to be you know, flour, diapers, camp food, things like that. Uh, and as, as many people aren't aware, because the media is not reporting it very well, right? so, on, on the flip side, what we see is the situation in Syria starting to come to a head. Syria, for the past few days, they're planning to carry out airstrikes. The Syrian government recently made a statement saying it would be open to working with.
geopolitical ramifications. It's true that at the beginning, the media, which had um, sourced its news and its analysis from the mainstream Western media, including agencies like Associated Press and AFP and Reuters and so on, the media tended to give the impression that it was the work of the Russians or the pro-Russian rebels in eastern Ukraine. But after a week or so, when uh, questions were asked, and uh, we were among those who raised certain questions like, uh, why is the Ukrainian government reluctant to make public its satellite data, its military data? Why is the United States reluctant to make public its military data? And the only one which had made public its military data at that point was Russia. So when questions like this were raised and uh, articles began to appear from outside, not from the conventional sources, which raised questions about what had really happened, I think people began to reflect. It took a while, but over a period of two weeks or so, one could notice a perceptible change in um, the media. And also, if you look at the position taken by the Malaysian government, I think two events helped to bring about this change. One since Malaysians were largely concerned about uh, the tragedy itself and about uh, the remains of uh, the victims. And the Malaysian Prime Minister had um, established contact with the leader of the rebels in eastern Ukraine. And uh, this was made public. And the Prime Minister himself had said that uh, the leader of the rebels was cooperative and he was prepared to help. Malaysia, one, in terms of uh, bringing back the remains, number two, the black box, and number three, in going to the actual site of the tragedy. And I think that had an impact upon the Malaysian public. They began to feel that, uh, well, these uh, rebels who have been blamed for the tragedy are actually quite cooperative. So that, I think, was a factor. And the second factor, I think uh, the Malaysian government at that point was quite emphatic in um, stating that uh, we wanted to know the whole truth about what had happened and justice must be done and we were prepared to bring the culprits to uh, justice, whatever happened. So I think these are two factors which had some impact upon the public mood. And you mentioned the papers to my I'm not aware of meetings between uh, the CIA or American officials and Malaysian officials. Even if there were such meetings, uh, they would not be made public. But I'm aware of the statement made by the Malaysian Minister of Defense. Uh, this was perhaps about uh, a week or 10 days ago, where he said that um, there was really no evidence to suggest that um, the Ukrainian government was involved in this uh, mishap. And um, he said that uh, it was certainly a missile that was um, delivered you know, from the ground. He seemed to be very certain about this. And uh, in the course of making that statement, he said that um, it could be either the pro-Russian rebels, or it could be the Ukrainian government, or it could be Russians, it could be anyone. But he also added that one should not speculate in that uh, statement of his. Now, I saw that statement as a little odd, 
because if you look at the media reports that were appearing before that and if you look at what the prime minister had done and uh, what the Malaysian government had said about wanting to ensure that the culprits were brought to book and then suddenly you have the minister of defense saying something like this which uh, gave one the impression that he was uh, sort of trying to take the heat away from uh, the Ukrainian government and indirectly the United States government which of course is uh, backing the Ukrainian government we were somewhat taken aback by his uh, statement but it was not pursued after that point it was not pursued i interpreted that statement as perhaps um, an attempt to sort of um, send a signal to the united states of america in particular that uh, while there are all these media reports appearing which seem to suggest that it could have been the ukrainian government as far as we are concerned we are actually neutral meaning by which the malaysian government maybe that was the intention behind that statement of his i would say that it was really unfortunate that the minister of defense given his position should make a statement of that sort it would have been better if he had um, spoken along the lines of the prime minister and uh, if he had um, reflected the opinion of uh, the Malaysian media at that time especially the new straits times which uh, was being very objective and analytical about what had happened but i don't think that statement by the minister of defense has had much uh, impact because if you look at what has been happening after that articles have continued to appear which uh, seem to suggest that uh, it could be the ukrainian government and these include articles by independent commentators it includes letters to the editor so that has continued to happen at least in the new straits times which i think is uh, something that's um, welcome because we want to know the whole truth we don't want anyone to hide the truth because this involves human lives and uh, malaysia in particular because it's our aircraft it's our airline and also because uh, we have uh, 43 victims in that uh, plane we don't want the truth to be concealed from our people or from the world which is why we have been continuing to press the authorities uh, myself a few others people like nal bawi we have been trying to say look uh, let's ensure that the truth is uh, told to the public There's a fact that uh, and there was an avalanche of um, uh, reports uh, about this but right now um, I get the impression that um, after the initial finger pointing at uh, Russia and the pro Russian rebels in Ukraine the Americans have gone silent they have not said much about MH17 and we don't have um, news here in malaysia about what the ukrainian government is saying but i suspect that they also not talking a lot about this episode which may suggest that they have something to hide if you look at what they had said at the beginning and now they've chosen to be silent and if you look at um, other reports that i've been reading it is quite possible that there is an attempt to cover up you are silent and then you try ways and means of covering up what's been happening and how can this be done it may be done through the investigation committee it could be done through whoever has analyzed the black box so you try to sort of uh, give the impression that well maybe this is not what happened or you may even come up with a decision that uh, we will only make the findings public if everyone agrees which will include the ukrainian government and indirectly it will include uh, others you know like netherlands because don't forget uh, the government of the netherlands and the netherlands that has had the largest number of passengers in that ill-fated flight netherlands is an ally of the us and so is australia an ally of the us 
and so is Belgium. So if you look at all those countries, they perhaps may decide to go along with the US at the end of the day. This is something that we have to be aware of. I don't know to what extent the Malaysian government is aware of this. I think they are aware that this could happen. But this is where I sincerely believe that the Malaysian public has got a role to play. We must never allow this cover-up to happen if there is such an intention. Because if you allow that, it would be a terrible injustice. And why do I say it would be a terrible injustice? Because there is another aircraft that has disappeared just four months before the MH17 tragedy. And one doesn't really know what happened until today. It is very, very odd, the disappearance of MH370. It could also be a victim of geopolitics, like in this case, MH17, it was clearly a victim of geopolitics. And in the case of MH370, maybe it involved uh, China and the US, and something um, which uh, some people don't want to make public, they don't want the world to know, maybe something had happened. So this is why we are very, very concerned. And speaking about MH17, I just want you... Certainly. If you look at um, what had happened immediately after MH17, at that uh, moment when they were trying to sort of um, exploit the emotions of the people and uh, trying to fingerprint Russia and the pro-Russian rebels. It was obvious that uh, there was an agenda. And uh, I saw two developments emanating out of that attempt to fingerprint Russia and the pro-Russian rebels. Number one, very soon after what had happened, there was this attempt to increase, to escalate the sanctions against uh, Russia. There was this meeting in Brussels and uh, the United States announced tougher sanctions and the Europeans were sort of being persuaded to go along. You must remember that early on some of the European governments were a bit reluctant to go along with uh, the US push for very, very tough sanctions, partly because Europe has got extensive trade, investment and financial relations with uh, Russia. But after this tragedy, given that a lot of the people on the aircraft were Europeans, there was clearly an attempt to exploit public sentiments in Europe in order to increase sanctions. And that's something that they got, in a sense. They managed to increase sanctions after the terrible tragedy. So when you put two and two together, you say, well, the tragedy happens, you exploit mass emotions, you use those mass emotions for the purpose of enhancing sanctions. This is what I meant when I said who gains, because that is a critical question that one should ask in a qui bono, who gains from a tragedy of this sort. And the second thing that happened, you would have uh, noticed, it was around that time that the Ukrainian government also began to intensify its operations in um, Donetsk, for instance, and Luhansk, they decided to really step up their operations, which, um, again, the general public was not aware of this, but um, I think those military operations were quite brutal. If you look at what had been happening, it was clearly an attempt to crush the rebels, and again, under cover of the tragedy so that people would say, well, you know, I mean, the people who did this, they shot down a commercial airline and they killed innocent people, so you must do something about this. And there was a lot of emphasis on the fact that uh, a military aircraft, a transport plane, had been shot earlier by the rebels. The rebels admitted this, that they had shot a military aircraft belonging to the Ukrainian government and a transport plane. But shooting a military aircraft and a transport plane is not the same as shooting a commercial aircraft. Everyone knows that, you know, because the rebels don't have aircraft. And when you have uh, military aircraft bombarding the rebels, they have to react. And uh, they didn't hide it. 
But in the case of shooting a commercial airliner, it is something else. They have no reason to shoot a commercial airliner. And uh, this is why when I looked at the events after that, it seemed very obvious to me that uh, it was basically Ukraine and the United States behind Ukraine who benefited from the MH17 tragedy. And they know that given the new media environment, they cannot really cover up because things will emerge sooner or later and it will be politically very embarrassing if they try to cover up this game so far and I think that is a good sign and I also look at other signs you know um, on Wednesday next week the constitutional monarchy the king is visiting China and um, the fact that you know the prime minister other senior leaders have gone to China and uh, now you have the king going there on an official visit. I think uh, we are still maintaining positive signs that uh, I think um, they know that uh, they cannot. Uh, the terrible tragedy that's happened, of course, has been Gaza and Palestine. And Malaysia's stand has been very clear. We have not compromised one inch. С самого начала э, малазийские власти заняли очень разумную позицию по э, ситуации вокруг э, сбитого Боинга. Э, несмотря на вот эту э, активную и оголтелую информационную атаку против России, малазийское, малазийское правительство э, с самого начала заявляло о том, что оно не будет никого обвинять пока не будут известны результаты расследования. Конечно, общественное мнение на эмоциональной волне и под валом антироссийских обвинений испытало на первом этапе антироссийские настроения, но, к счастью, ситуация сейчас коренным образом изменилась. Возобладал здравый смысл, во многом благодаря позиции малазийских властей, но и, собственно говоря, благодаря тому, что совершенно стало очевидно, что никаких доказательств причастности ни России, ни повстанцев в Донецкой области к этой трагедии нет. Мы с первых минут постоянно общались с малазийскими властями и с Министерством иностранных дел Малайзии, и с Министерством обороны. Мы предоставили всю информацию, которую могли по то, что, те, те данные, которые мы располагали по ситуации с а, самолетом. А, и мы от наших малазийских а, коллег а, слышали, что а, российская сторона, это была единственная сторона, которая предоставила достоверную информацию, достоверные данные о ситуации вокруг самолета. Перебивка. Китайский язык учил в институте. Десять лет работала в Лаосе, потом у меня была командировка в Таиланде. И вот неожиданно попала в Малайзию, честно говоря, я не... Все природные явления, и горы, и море, острова, очень красиво. Здесь прекрасный, самый вообще древний лес в мире. Нет здесь, на континент, в континентальной Малайзии, называется государственный национальный парк. Yeah, um, I think the stand of our government with regard to these uh, tragedies are basically calculated and more neutral. I think the government is aware that we are a small nation. We are not going to meddle with the superpowers politics. Hence, I think the government are waiting for more evidence to surface, um, the analysis of the evidences, so that perhaps uh, later on the government would pursue a um, more proper channel to, 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 to dispense the justice for, for, the, for, for our country, yeah. And referring to the uh, last statement of the American official giving CIA access to uh, 
Uh, thus far, in the mainstream media, things have not been very much clear about this uh, statement made by our defence minister. But on the ground, sentiment on the ground among the Malaysian people, I think we do have some suspicion with regard to the hands behind these tragedies. Uh, we are not under blaming anyone uh, outside um, this country, but, but we do believe the expansion of NATO worldwide, uh, the, the backyard of Russia, do provide some bearings on the tragedies of MH17. Yeah. From my own personal observation, I can see that um, in mainstream media, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the newspapers, there are uh, dissenting views uh, against America and its allies, especially NATO's, with regard to the tragedies because of uh, the, the theater of war in Ukraine did contribute to, to, to such uh, tragedies that we have not really managed to pinpoint the exact culprit of the, of the uh, perpetrators. Nonetheless, um, as we all know, the geopolitical instability of, in Ukraine, um, as we all know, due to the color revolutions uh, sponsored by um, people like NED, uh, Open, Source Insti Open uh, Society Institute, uh, did have some bearings. And these are pretty much uh, prevalent views among the Malaysian, especially among the people, even though it might not be the official stand of the government. I think um, this event do have some silver lining, I would say, in the sense that now I think Malaysia would pretty much realise that we, geography is power and geography is destiny because we all know, even though Malaysia is, is a small country, but we are the custodian, the vanguard of one of the most important choke points in the world, which is the Strait of Malacca. Uh, thus far in this sea lane of communication, uh, there has never been superpower who control um, the, the Strait as compared to Hormuz, for example, who is pretty much influenced by the Carter's doctrine of the American, uh, of, the, of the United States. So I believe the tragedies in Ukraine or even the MH370, it will will create more um, awareness for Malaysian government and Malaysian at large to be more cognizant of our strategic importance or pivot as used by the American uh, foreign policy with regard to our uh, um, uh, countries near, uh, near Eurasian countries like Russia and China, Korea and Japan. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thus far, our government does not really uh, give out proper explanation with regard to uh, our connection between those two tragedies and our relationship with China and Russia but the Malaysian public at large I would say in the in the alternative media um, in in Facebook in Twitter they do think uh, tra the tragedies are part of the grand design of superpowers uh, to, to upset the the relationship between Malaysia and Russia and China because we all know as I said earlier we are the custodian of Strait of Malacca, where almost 75% 70, of our uh, oil needs of Eurasian countries come from this part of the world. So such tragedies will create more, I would say, uh, stress between those nations. And I think it's not good in the long run if, if Malaysia still could not um, find proper allies or proper stand with regard to geopolitical instability in, in, in this region. That's why I have not seen or read anyone who can't connect the dots between the